Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Alderman. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I'll be showing you the first out of five rounds today. Now, before we go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and gain access to a wide variety of exclusive perks, then please visit patreon.com slash Games. When you support the channel, you can gain access to my opinions episodes, where I go in-depth about my thoughts about all the games I'm playing recently, both the things I like and don't like. You can also watch some videos early and advertisement-free, and you'll gain access to an exclusive podcast feed where you can hear audio versions of all of the vlogs that I make. Now, the final thing I'd like to ask is if while you're watching this video, some part of the game really jumps out to you as interesting, then please comment about that down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Before we start, the last thing to point out is that today I'm filming with a prototype version of the game. That means the art and components that you see here might not match those in the final version. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Now, it is set in the Middle Ages, specifically in the city of Lübeck, but play will encompass much of Northern Europe as we go. In this game, each player is a trader in the Hanseatic League, and as we go through the game, we're going to sail around Northern Europe, acquiring resources and selling them. We're also going to be placing influence down into a bunch of different cities as we vie to gain as many votes as possible in the Hanseatic League's council. Once the game is over, the player with the most votes is going to win the game and control the most powerful seat on that council. Now, the game itself is going to take place over five full rounds, and within each of those rounds, we are going to be producing a variety of resources depending on the infrastructure that we've already constructed. Then we're going to be going through four seafaring phases where we are going to spend actions sailing around and performing a surprisingly broad variety of actions that are here in those cities. Once we are done seafaring, it will then be time for the council phase, where players are going to auction off the influence cubes they have gathered up to that point, and then they can use those cubes to gain access to a wide variety of powerful effects. They might be one-shot effects or give you ongoing benefits for the rest of the game. After that, we then prepare for the next round, and we do that five times before the game is over. At game end, we're going to add up all the votes we've already acquired, and then we'll gain more votes based off of some area majorities with the buildings that we construct in Lübeck as well as the influence that we've placed in various regions all throughout Northern Europe. We get uh, votes for a couple of other things, and then again, the player with the most votes will be the winner. Now, obviously, there is a lot going on to this game, and don't worry, I'll explain how each of these things work while we are actually playing. And on that note, I think it's now time to start playing the game. For today's tutorial, we are going to play as the purple player right over here, and let's now begin the first round of the game. With that in mind, let's focus over here. Now, as I briefly mentioned in the overview, we are going to have a production phase, then we'll have a seafaring phase, and then we will finish things off with a council phase. Now, in the first round of the game, we actually skip the production phase entirely. So I'll explain how that works once we start the next round of the game. And because we're skipping phase one, we can jump right into phase two, which is the seafaring phase. Now, this is split into four quarters, and in each one of these quarters, players are going to use the indicated actions to do a variety of things. Normally, the first thing that we do is flip over the first one of these tokens and then spin the resource wheels on our boards. However, we don't do that in the first quarter of the first round of the game, so we'll see that happen once we get over here. Now, as you can see, this shows three action points on it, and that means each player is going to gain three actions that they can spend in this first quarter of the first round. So it's time to start spending actions, and now we can look over here for the turn order. This was put out randomly at the start of the game, and it will change based off of how we do the council phase later on, and I'll explain how that works when we get there. For now, though, we can see that as the purple player, we are the first player, then green will be second, and orange will be third, and that will be the same for all four quarters of this seafaring phase. So that means we can now take our turn. As I mentioned before, each of us has three actions to spend in this quarter. We can use this token to track the actions that we have actually taken, and we can actually use this track for a variety of other things, like producing various resources, as well as having costs that we have to pay as well, and I'll explain how those things work later on. For now, we don't have any of those, and we do have three actions to spend. 
With that in mind, let's focus over here on the map part of the board. Now, as you can see, we have a ship here in Lubeck. All of us start there at the beginning of the game. And during the seafaring phase, what we're going to do is sail around and then perform actions in the cities that we arrive at. Now, specifically, the way this works is when we move across one line, we don't spend any actions, but we are forced to spend at least one action in the city that we arrive at. We are not allowed to spend actions at a city that we start our turn at. So we can do nothing in Lubeck right now, but we could leave Lubeck, do an action in another city, and then head back to Lubeck and perform at least one action there on the same turn. We just have to arrive back there before we can spend those actions. With this in mind, we need to leave Lubeck, and I think we'll head over here to Alborg. Now, once we arrive, as I said, we have to spend at least one action there. And with that in mind, let's focus in even more. Now, as you can see, there is an action card that was placed here randomly during setup, and it has two rows on it. Now, we can do up to one thing on each of these rows, and on each row, there is a one, two, and three action option. Although, actually, on this top row, there is no third action option. So that means we could do this or this, and we could do this, this, or this. Now, of course, we only have so many actions to spend. If we do a three action option, we won't have any other actions to do on this turn. We could, however, do a two action option here and a one action there. We could also perform one of these single actions and then move on to another city if we wanted to. Now, as I said before, because we arrived at the city, we are forced to do at least one action here. And if we don't want to do any of the actions that show up on this card, there is an alternate option. This is called an alternate trade, and it costs one action, and with that, you can then purchase one resource for this price over here, or you could sell one resource from your storage for that price right over there. Again, that takes one action, and if you do this, you are not allowed to perform any other actions in that city. Now, I don't think we want to do that for this first turn. Instead, I think I want to spend all three of our actions performing this buy goods action here. Now, you may have noticed this icon shows up there and there. We could, of course, do a single action buy and another single action buy both in the city, but I've decided the triple action buy is better, and I'll explain why now. Let's focus back on our player board, and specifically on this goods wheel here. Now, as you can see, there is a blue, purple, yellow, green, and red area around the outside, and the city of Alborg is in the blue region of the board. That means the only thing we have to focus on is this little pie slice right over here associated with blue. And when we focus in, you can see this is split into three different rings associated with doing a single action buy, a double action buy, or a triple action buy. Now, if we were to do a single action buy, we would get one good, and this crate is just going to be the resource that shows up here that's associated with that region. So whenever you get a crate in the blue region of the board, that's going to turn into one stone resource. And I don't really think I want just one stone for an action. Now, if we had a two buy action in the city, we could spend those two actions to get a beer and a fish, but Alborg didn't actually have a two buy action. It had single buy actions and a triple buy action. I decided to go for the triple buy, and that means for three actions, we are going to gain two fish as well as four wheat. Now, before we take those, you may be wondering what this is over here. As you can see, that shows two wheat and a spice, and then it has a brown background. Now, over here on the board, this shows a gray background, and when we focus out, you can see certain regions on the wheel show gray or brown. Now, brown is associated with spices, and gray is associated with fur pelts, and spices and pelts are luxury goods in this game. They are very hard to come by, and they can be worth a bunch of money if you are able to sell them. Now, you only get access to being able to buy them if these match. Because this is brown and gray, that means this entire area is off limits. But, for example, if we were buying over here in the yellow trading area of the board, then the brown matches that brown there. And instead of getting these resources, we could gain one spice, a stone, as well as a wood. Likewise, if we were to match a gray pelt over here with that gray on the blue area, then that would give us the option of getting the pelt as well as the thing underneath it. But again, since these don't match, that's not an option, so this is what we're going to gain. As I mentioned before, this is going to get us four wheat and two fish, and all goods have to be stored in order to keep them. At the start of the game, each player has a 3 by 4 storage area, so we can only hold 12 goods. During setup, each player got to make some choices for some starting goods. We began with a meat and a stone, and we also gained an improvement, and I'll explain what that's going to do for us later on. So, as you can see, after that action, we only have four empty spots in our storage remaining, but there are ways to gain extra storage that we can use, and I'll explain how we can gain access to this extra storage later on in the tutorial. 
I do want to mention that at any point, you can just get rid of resources in order to clear up spots for resources you care about more. For now, we are looking pretty good over here, though. And of course, we did spend three actions to do that. So we can simply slide our token over to show that we've used all of our actions. And that means our turn is over. This means it's time for the green player to go. And just like the rest of us, they have at least three actions to spend. And the reason I say at least is because the green player picked up a couple of extra action tokens during setup. Now we can gain these through a few different ways. One of them is just by getting action production that will get you these tokens during the production phase. I'll explain the production phase later on. And these tokens can be spent at any point when you are doing actions. The only restriction is you are never allowed to gain more than six actions total. So right now they have three actions here. So if they had four of these extra action tokens, they could only spend up to three of those, bringing them to the maximum of six actions per quarter per player. Obviously, they only have these two, so they could spend them right now and have five actions at the moment, or they could hold onto these for the future when they need them more. Green has decided to start by sailing from Lubeck up to Malmo. Then they, of course, have to perform at least one action here. And they've decided to do this one action option up here. Remember, you can do up to one action from the top row and up to one action from the bottom row. Now, this action says they can gain one coin from the bank and they can spin their resource wheel once. They can place that money over here. They only started the game with one, so they now have two. And then they can spin their resource wheel clockwise. Whenever you spin this, it has to go clockwise. And every five times this spins around, these lines are going to line up with these influence bonuses. When that happens, you can put an influence down onto the map for free. And that is definitely a reason to keep spinning these wheels. Also, every time you spin this goods wheel, it's going to change the variety of things that you can gain at various places on the map. Well, that spent one of their actions, which means now they can leave, and they've decided to head over here to Mamel. Once here, they have two actions left that they do want to spend. It's worth noting you don't have to spend all of the actions that you get from these tiles, but any excess go away. Of course, green has a couple of extra actions they have banked up that they could use now or later. At the moment, they've decided they're going to spend two actions here doing that. Now, this looks very similar to that. It's a two-wheel spin, and they gain two coins for that. So they can add those coins over here and then spin the wheel two more times. And that means they are just two spins away from getting that bonus influence action. I'll explain how that action works a little bit more later on. But for now, they have spent all three of the base actions they get. And they've decided they're going to hold on to these for a future time. So that means they're done with their turn. Checking back over here, that means the brown player now gets to go. Just like the rest of us, they started here in Lubeck, and they've decided to follow us over here to Alborg. It's important to note there is no penalty or benefit for going to a location where any other player ships are. Once here, they do have to perform at least one action, and they've decided to spend two actions. In particular, they'll do this top option up here. Now, this is a good splitting action. That means they can split up two of their goods into lower value goods, and they'll also gain one coin. They can place one money over here, and now they get to split up to two of their trade goods. Now, with that in mind, let's focus over here and talk a little bit more about the various quality levels of trade goods in the game. As you can see, there's level one, two, three, and four. And within each of these levels, there are two different goods. These four on the left are building material items, and these four on the right are food items. This is wood, stone, tools, and glass, and then that's meat, beer, fish, and wheat. Now, every time you do a splitting action, you can choose one good and split it into smaller goods as long as the overall values at least match up. In this case, the brown player has decided they want to split this fish. Fish is a second level good, so that means they can turn this into two of the lower level goods, and it does not have to directly match. So this fish could turn into one wood and a wheat, or two wood, or two wheat. They could also just gain one of these resources, but it makes sense to get as many as they can. Now, in this case, they've decided they want two wheat, so they will give up the fish and then take the wheat and place that into their storage. Now, the action they chose lets them split up to two times, and they've decided to forego that second split. They do have beer and tools, which are level threes, so you could split a beer into a stone and a wheat, for example, or that tool could turn into just three wood. That's very flexible, but they've decided they have other plans for these items, so they are not going to do that second split. Now, that costs them two actions, and they still have one more action that they can spend. And with it, they've decided to sail over to Oslo. 
Once they arrive, they must spend an action here. It's worth noting, if you're out of actions, you are not allowed to sail to any other cities. Now, they only have one action left, so they could do this, which we've seen already. That would get them one coin, and they would spin their goods wheel once. Or they could do this option, and that is what they've decided to do. Now, this is going to cost them five money, and then they can take one influence cube from the general supply and place it into this city. Currently, the brown player has 11 money, so they have no problem spending five of it and then they can place this influence down. Now, there are two different options for them. The first is they could place it over here into this block. When you place over here, you have to put it into the topmost, leftmost empty influence spot. And the other option is right over here. This is the subsidiary spot, and most of the cities on the board have a single location for that. A couple of the cities have no locations, and as soon as one person puts an influence cube there, it stays there for the rest of the game. Now, having a cube in the subsidiary spot can be powerful, because functionally for that player, that city acts just like Lubeck for the purpose of city actions. Now, whenever you are in Lubeck or a city with a subsidiary, you can perform as many city actions as you want, and they don't even consume your main actions in the game. And I haven't explained those just yet, and don't worry, I will get to that soon. Now, Brown could place this over here, but there is an extra cost of five coins every time you want to place one of these down. Brown does have six coins at the moment, but they've decided they don't need a subsidiary at the moment. Instead, they're going to save their money and put this influence cube over into the right spot. Now, let's focus back in, because as you can see, there are 10 locations over here that can take these cubes. Once they are all full, no one else can place influence over here, and influence in all of these cities on the board is going to help us vie for some extra votes during final scoring, and I'll explain how that works later on. Now, I'm sure you've noticed these cycle icons here in the rightmost column, and those are important because every time any player puts an influence cube on one of those, we will then get rid of the action card for that city and then draw a new one from the top of this deck. Now, this is the main way that the actions are going to change out here on the map. And it's important to note that if a new action card comes out in the middle of your turn, you are not allowed to perform new actions on it until you leave the city and come back to it. Now, obviously, this is not here just yet, but once again, you can see that by putting that cube there, as soon as any other player puts an influence cube on this side, that will get rid of these actions and then mix things up with a new action card from the deck. Now, this did cost the brown player one action, and that was their final action, so that's finished their turn. All right, we've all performed a turn in this first quarter, so we can remove this token and put it onto this stack. During the setup for a new round, we shuffle up these six tokens, and they have actions on the back that range from two to five. We can put this right over here, and now it's time to move into the second quarter. And the first thing that we do is everybody must rotate their trade goods wheel once, and we can also flip this over. Oh, we only each have two actions to spend in this quarter. So we can gain those actions and rotate. And now it's time for our turn once again. I do want to reiterate that the turn order does not change within each one of these quarters, but it may change at the end of each one of the game's rounds. So we have two actions to use, and I think I want to simply sail from Alborg over to Edinburgh. Once here, we can spend up to two of our actions. We can see for one action, we could buy goods, and for one action, we could also sell goods. Now, whenever we sell goods, we have to have these exact goods printed down at the bottom, and we currently don't have those, so I'll explain how selling works in more detail later on. There are some other options over here, but as you can see, these two cost three actions, and we only have two. So it looks like we are either buying goods for one action, or we're doing this other two action option, and this one lets us gain two influence cubes into our supply. With these two options in mind, let's focus back on our board. Now, Edinburgh is in the green area, so that's right down here, and we have the option of doing a single action buy. So that would just get us one stone. We already have a stone, and I don't think we really need it. So I think instead of doing the buy action, let's do the two action option, which is going to gain us two influence, and we are simply going to put those into our own supply. Now, we already saw the orange player put an influence from their general supply right out onto the board. And when it comes to cubes in our personal supply, we don't actually use them that way. Instead, these are primarily used for an influence auction to gain access to these powerful council effects once we reach the council phase of this round. We'll explain how that works later on, but it's definitely a good idea to have at least two influence when we get into that phase. So spending this turn getting those two it did seem to be worth it to me. Well, we've used all of our actions, so now the green player can go. And it looks like they have a similar thought to us. They're going to sail from Memel over to Malmo. And once here, they're going to spend three actions to gain three influence cubes into their personal supply. 
Now, they only have two actions from the quarter tile, but they do have these banked actions, so they're going to spend those two and one of these to get to the three. Then they can take these three cubes and put those into their supply. That finished a quick turn for green, and now brown can go. And they've decided to start by sailing from Oslo down to Malmo. That's where green is. Once here, Brown has decided they want to sell goods. Now, selling is this icon down here. And as you can see, there are two different types of selling options in the game. One is selling four goods, and the other one is selling four, six, or eight goods. Now, the goods they have to sell are dictated by these icons at the bottom of the action card. As you can see, there are four, then two, and then two. So what this means is whenever you do a selling for four action, you have to sell these exact four. So that is two wheat, a tool, and a beer. And if you remember from their last turn, I mentioned that they did not want to split their beer and their tool up, and that's because they were planning on doing this sell action on their next turn. Now, in order to sell these exact four goods, that takes one action. And if they wanted to sell more than four, that would cost two actions. Now, whenever you sell six or eight, you have to sell the indicated extra goods that are printed over here. So a selling of six would be these four plus a pelt and a stone. And if you wanted to sell eight, you would have to sell exactly all eight of these trade goods back to the supply. Now, at the moment, the brown player only has these four. So they're going to do a single action sell. As you can see, they have the two wheat, the one tool, and the one beer, so all of these will go back to the supply. After that, they can gain rewards based off of the number of goods they sold. Whenever you sell four goods, you gain 10 money from the bank and one influence cube into your supply. If you sell six goods, you get 15 money, two influence into your supply, and then another influence from the general supply that is then placed into the city where their ship currently is. So this is another way to place that influence down into the cities, and this one doesn't even cost money. Lastly, if you sell all eight, you get 20 money. You also gain a three-vote card. It looks just like this, and at the end of the game, we just count up our votes, and whoever has the most votes wins. So gaining these is definitely great, and then that also lets you take two of these cubes and you place those down into the city you are at and again having these cubes in cities is great for gaining extra votes when we do final scoring and again i'll explain how that works later on in the tutorial for now we can come back over here because they sold four goods so that means they'll gain 10 money and one influence they can put the money right over there they're kind of rich and then they can put one influence cube down here into their personal area they're done selling and that only cost one of their actions so they do have another one to spend if they want and with that last action, they're going to sail from Malamo up to Visby. Now, they do have to spend an action here, so they could either sell, but they would need to have a wood, a fish, a stone, and a tool, and right now, they don't have anything. Or they could do this here, or, of course, they could not do any of these actions and do the alternate trade action, where they could simply spend money to buy a resource according to its cost, or just sell one resource according to that cost that's printed on the player board. For now, though, Brown is actually very okay with doing this action. That lets them spend one action, three money and one cube from their personal area in order to gain an improvement. They have a cube that they can spend from the personal area. They also have to spend three money and now they can gain an improvement. Now these are stored right down here. As you can see at the start of the game, we actually all have two barrier tokens placed over here. That means at the beginning of the game, we can only have three improvements. And if we construct guild houses into Lubeck, we can actually clear these barriers. So a single guild house would allow a player to have four improvements, and two guild houses constructed would allow a player to have five improvements. Now, I haven't discussed constructing buildings just yet, and don't worry, I will get to that soon. But for now, the brown player has paid for this improvement, so they can now take one and place it down here. Now, the way this works is they can look over here to the improvement market. As you can see, there are four of these out here, and they can select one of these. And then after they do that, the rest will slide down, and we'll draw a new random one and place it onto this market. Now, the way these improvements work is once per round, if you meet the requirement at the top, you can then gain the benefit listed at the bottom and then flip it over. And then at the end of the round, they will all refresh. So they have some really nice effects, but again, they only work in certain moments. Out of all of these options, they've decided to go with this one here. So now the rest will slide over. We can pull a new random one from the supply and put it over there. And now they can add this improvement to their area. Now the one they picked up shows a 3x level 4 good requirement at the top. And at the bottom, it says they can place one influence cube from the general supply onto the city where their ship is. 
Now what this means is they could activate this improvement as long as they have at least three level four goods in their supply. Obviously, currently they don't have any, but this gives them a little goal. And the moment they have those, they can flip this over and gain that benefit. They don't have to spend those goods, they just have to have them. So they'll place these over here, and that's certainly going to dictate their actions for the next couple turns, I think. Because once again, you can use each one of these once per round. And if you don't use it, then you don't get that benefit. So it definitely makes sense to try and gain that effect. Now this did cost their final action, so that's finished their turn. Which means we finished the quarter. We can now reveal the next one, and of course all of us will rotate our goods wheels once. Oh wow, we all get five actions this time. So let's gain those, and then of course spin our goods wheels. And the moment green spins down here, you'll notice they have now rotated five times, and they now get the influence bonus. Once again, this happens every time this line along the goods wheel lines up with these influence bonus markers. Now, what happens in this moment is they take one influence from the general supply, and they get to place it down into the city where their ship is. And if they want to make this a subsidiary, they will have to spend five coins. Currently, they only have four coins, though, so that's not an option for them. But they're still fine with that. Currently, they are in Malmo, so they can place this cube into the top leftmost empty spot over here. All right, it's now time for us to take our turn, and we have five actions to use. Now, I think our goal for the turn is to head back to Lubick so that we can perform maybe a couple of city actions. I'll talk about those in more detail soon, but we need some different resources in order to construct specifically a building that I have my eye on. So with that in mind, I think let's head back over to Alborg, and then let's spend two of our actions to do this split action up here. That lets us split two of our goods, and we will gain one coin. So let's take the coin and spend the two action points. And then I think let's split this meat up. It's a level four, which means we can split it into other smaller types. And I think we want to take a tool, which is a level three, and a wood, which is a level one. So that's one plus three or four, so that is fine. We of course have to store all of this stuff. And then I think let's split this fish apart, and that is a level two, and let's turn this into two pieces of wood. We can add those into our storage, and we don't have that much space left, but fortunately I have plans to spend most of this on our turn. We have three actions left, and while in Alberg, I think let's do the bottom row, and let's spend one action to buy. This is a blue city, so let's look back at our wheel, and we're spending one action, so that means this is the part that we care about. That shows a crate, which means we're going to get whatever this is, and that shows a stone. So we can take that, and we have just one spot left in our storage. And of course we have two actions left. With that in mind, let's head back to Lubick and spend our final two actions doing a new thing, which is called upgrading. Now this lets us upgrade twice and we're gonna gain one coin. The coin can go right here. And then when we upgrade, we can select a good like this tool and then turn it into something that is one step above. Now I think we need glass and a tool is a level three and a glass is a level four. So we can upgrade this tool into a piece of glass. Now we get two upgrade options. And I don't think we currently need two stone, so let's upgrade that. It's a level two into a level three. That could become a beer or a tool. And I think we're going to take the tool back. So technically, we could have just upgraded that stone to a tool into a glass, but realistically, we arrived at the same place. Now, this did cost our final two actions, so you might think our turn is done. However, we are currently in Lubick. And when we focus back on the board, you can see that Lubick shows these anchors for all of the player colors. That means we can do city actions in this city, and there are four different action options to choose from. None of these actually take our action points, and we can do them as many times as we want on our turn. Although it's worth noting, in order to do these, we have to have just arrived at the city. So you can't just start at Lubeck and do city actions, you would have to leave and come back. Now I mentioned this before, but some places allow you to put subsidiary cubes down, and whenever there is a subsidiary cube in your color, and your ship is there, then you can perform all of these city actions in that city. It's essentially a subsidiary of Lubeck for you. So let's take a look at this player aid once again, and I think what we want to do first is buy some land. Now the cost to do that is printed over here on the round marker. I mentioned that this game is going to be five rounds long, and the cost to buy land starts at four coins, then it goes to five, then six, seven, and then finally eight in the final round of the game. So it's cheaper to buy land early, and now we can buy as much as we want for four coins each. 
We currently have eight coins, so technically we could afford to buy two pieces of land. Now that is an attractive proposition, considering, again, the land is only going to get more expensive as the game goes on. However, I think we are going to need one of these coins to construct the building I'd like to do. So I think we only have enough money technically to buy one of these right now. So we spent four, and we have four remaining, and now we can claim a plot of land in Lubeck. With that in mind, we can focus down here on the bottom of the board. Now this shows a bunch of land plots, and it's also split into five different districts. Now every district has a name, like St. Marianne and St. Johannes over here. And when we buy plots of land, we can put our token down onto any empty spot. We just can't cover up one of these golden areas right here, because that explains the amount of votes players will get if they have a majority of strength in these regions once the game is over. Now, much like other majorities, I'll explain how this works later on in the tutorial. And now we can place this down onto any of these empty spots, and I think we'll go right over here. Now that means this is our plot of land for the rest of the game, nobody can take that away from us, and we now have the option to construct a building on top of our plot of land. If we look back at our cheat sheet, constructing a building is one of those city actions, and you can only construct buildings onto land that you own. So I think let's do it. With that in mind, let's focus back on our board, and we have a big pile of resources over here, and it's now time to look at the building cheat sheet. Now, there's a bunch of buildings that come in this game, and they are split into a silver border set and a gold border set. Now, the gold ones are more powerful, and they cost more resources to construct. These are the resources to actually construct the buildings, and I think we are going to start with the very top option over here and to construct a gabled house. Now, that means we have to spend four wood, one stone, one glass, and one coin, and this house is going to increase our coin production by four. So this is really going to help us get more coins as we continue throughout the game, and as you've seen so far, spending coins is definitely something we're going to be doing quite often. Now, as I said, we need to spend four wood, but as you can see, we only have three. We do have everything else that we need. However, we also have an improvement. As part of setup, we got this improvement, and that says that when we are constructing a house, we can flip this over and then get a two wood discount. Now, this is going to flip over right now, so we spend two less wood, and this will flip back and become usable again in the next round of the game. It really is a good idea to try and use these improvements if you can within a round, because if you don't, well, then you don't get to reap those benefits. So, with that discount in mind, we can now construct this gabled house for two wood, one stone, one glass, and one coin. We can spend the coin here, we've got a glass, we've got the stone, and we also have the two wood. That means we can find a gabled house tile down over here in the market. That is right here. And once again, as you can see, this has a silver border around the outside. I've organized these to the silver border buildings and the gold border buildings over there. Each one of these buildings does something different. And again, that is detailed here on this sheet. Now, once again, as I mentioned, the gabled house is going to increase our coin production by four. But before we get to that, we do have to place this building down onto a plot of land that we own, and currently there's just this one here. So we can put the gabled house on there and now gain those benefits. Once again, this is going to increase our coin production by four, so we can find our coin production token and then put that next to the four slot. Now, when we do our production at the start of the next round, that is going to make four coins for us, which is great. However, Every single time we build a building, our infrastructure cost is going to increase. For these silver border ones, it has a final value of one coin as an infrastructure penalty. And on the backside, these gold border ones have a penalty of two. What that means is we have to take this coin penalty marker and put it next to the one. Now, this means during production, we are going to owe one coin. So we effectively are making three coins by constructing that building, which is still great. And again, it's worth noting, every time you build any of these silver border buildings, that is going to increase your coin expenditure during production by one. And every time you construct a gold border building, that will increase this expenditure by two. Now, there is a wide variety of effects that come from these buildings. Many of them increase your income, like this one increases the influence tokens you can put over here. And back here, there's a whole bunch of resources that you can generate. But there are also buildings with other varied effects, and some of them are only usable a maximum of four times throughout the game. Well, that building is constructed, but I think we're still not done with our turn. We can come back to these city actions, which again, we can only do while in Lubeck or a city that is a subsidiary for us. And now I think it's time to throw a feast. That is this jester hat here. And you may have noticed that that symbol also shows up on the round token. 
As you can see up at the top, this shows a jester hat, and that says we can throw a small feast by spending three wheat and one fish, and that will gain us three influence cubes into our personal supply. And there are also large feasts, although we can't do any large feasts in the first round of the game. As you can see in the second round, you could do a large feast, which would be two wheat, a fish, a beer, a meat, and four coins, and that gets you seven of those cubes compared to a small feast, which in the second round is going to be three wheat and two fish. Now, it's worth noting that when you perform a feast, you have to take a cube from the general supply and place it on top of this tile. And the reason for that is because only a number of feasts equal to the player count can happen in a round. So technically, we could throw three feasts, and if we did that, our opponents would not be able to do any feasts in this round. Or, of course, what's more likely is each of us might do a feast once per round. Either way, we do have to spend the three wheat as well as one fish... And then we will gain three more influence cubes into our personal supply. Well, I think that's finished a pretty good turn for us. I did say we were going to be spending most of these resources, and it looks like that did end up happening. All right, it's time for the green player to go. They've decided to start by heading over to Memel, and then while here, uh, once again, they're going to move their wheel up to twice and take two coins. So they can take the two money, and this did cost two actions, and they can rotate this once or twice, and they've actually decided to just rotate it the one time. After that, they're going to sail back to Danzig and then spend two actions buying goods in the yellow area. In this case, that's going to get them one more coin, and it's going to get them one glass. This is actually the reason they only moved this once instead of twice. They really wanted that glass. So they can add that to their supply. That costs them two more actions, and they have one action here, and they could spend this if they wanted to. And it looks like that is what they're going to do. They're going to sail to Lubeck and then do this action. That gets them one coin and two upgrades, and that does cost them two actions. So they can gain a coin and spend those actions. And then with the two upgrades, they are going to turn this wheat into a tool. Once again, the wheat is a level 1, and the tool is a level 3, so they upgrade once, and then they upgrade it again. At this point, they're done with these actions, but they are back in Lubeck, so just like us, they are going to spend 4 of their money in order to buy a plot of land. That leaves them with 4 money left over, and they've decided to buy this plot of land here. After that, it's no surprise to see they want to build here. You don't have to build immediately, but this is something they've been setting up. In particular, their plans involve constructing a gold-bordered brewery. This will take two wood, one tool, one glass, and then two more coins. And as you can see, they have exactly that, at least as far as these goods are concerned. They do have two coins left over, though. So they can take the brewery and place it right over here. And then the effect of the brewery says they can increase their beer production by one. Now, they actually started the game with one beer production, as well as a coin cost of one during production. So they can increase their production to two. And then they did construct one of these gold-bordered buildings, which means that's going to increase their gold cost during production by two more. So they'll have to update this. That means they go from one to three. So technically, they are making two beer in production and spending three money, which might seem like a problem, but they're hoping having this beer around is going to be worth it. And speaking of their beer production, it's now time to see a new city action, and that involves taking a council order card. We've already seen buying land, constructing buildings, and throwing feasts, but this last one is also a city action that has to happen either in Lubeck or a city where you have a subsidiary cube placed. Now, you may have noticed these earlier when we were looking at these improvements. During setup, we randomly dealt out four of these, and these are the only four we're going to see all game. Now, at the top of each one of these is a condition, and as long as you meet that condition and you are in Lubeck or a subsidiary city, then as a city action, you can take the card and then gain the benefit listed below. This one right over here says you have to have two spices in your storage. And if you do that, you can take this card and then gain this storage tile, which you can put in your area, which is going to add nine more storage spots. Currently, the green player does not have two spice, though. This next one says if you have at least one influence cube placed anywhere in all four of the purple cities, then you can claim this and gain 13 coins. It doesn't look like that's the case for them either, but this one should look familiar. You have to have a minimum of two beer production in order to claim this. That will give you three coins immediately and four votes for the end of the game. Now, this is indeed a city council order that the green player can fulfill. Although, before we do that, let's look at the last one. This says if you have a cube anywhere on Raval and Bruges, then you can claim this and get a glass as well as one meat. 
Bruges is down here, and Raval is up there, so it's going to be a while until somebody gets a cube on both of those, but it's very possible to do by the end of the game. Obviously that hasn't happened yet, but again, Green does have a minimum of two beer production, as you can see, so they can claim this as a city action. That will get them three coins immediately, and then they can just keep this in their area, and that will get them four more votes when the game is over, and remember, the player with the most votes is going to win the game. So they can gain three coins, which will help them pay this coin production cost that they will have in their future production phases. Well, green is fully done with their turn, but before we move on, I do need to fix something super quick. Every time a player constructs a building that produces something, it activates immediately as well as in future productions. So that means when we built our gabled house, well, that makes four coins, so we should have immediately gained four coins. We can fix that real quick. And then, of course, the green player just built a brewery, which increased their beer production by one, so that should make them a beer immediately. That will go right here, and now we can move on to the brown player's turn. After thinking through their plans, they're going to start by sailing from Visby over to Riga. Once here, they are going to spend three of their actions to purchase in this pink area. With a three action buy in the pink region, that is going to get them glass, wood, as well as fish. And of course, that's going to cost them three actions. They have two actions remaining. And the next thing they want to do is head to Raval, and they're going to do an alternate trade action here. So instead of doing any of these actions, they are going to buy or sell one good according to this chart. And they've decided to buy, and they're going to buy a glass. That is going to cost them four of their coins, and it will cost them one action. And now they have one action left. And they are not allowed to do any other actions in Raval, because again, when you do that alternate trade, that means you are doing none of these at all. Now, they've decided they're going to head back to Riga, and they're going to do another alternate trade here. So once again, they're not going to perform any of these, and they are going to, I think, buy some meat. Although I just realized they forgot to take their glass from that first one. Now they're going to buy meat, and that is also going to cost them four coins. And as soon as they gain this meat... They now have three of the level four tier trade goods in their storage. That lets them use this improvement. They did spend quite a bit of money to actually do this, but remember, they don't have to spend these, and they're sure they're going to find a good use for them in the future. So this lets them flip this improvement over, and then they can place an influence into the city where they're at. And that is Riga. Now, they've decided instead of putting the influence off to the side, they're going to make Riga a subsidiary. Remember, when you do this, you have to spend five extra coins, and they have exactly five coins at their disposal. Now, that means for the rest of the game, no other players can make Riga a subsidiary, and it means the brown player can perform all city actions while in Lubeck or while in Riga. So that means while here, they could buy land, construct buildings, throw feasts, as well as claim those council orders. At the moment, it looks like brown isn't going to be doing any of those, though. They're now going to stop their turn. So the third quarter is done. Now we can all rotate our good wheels clockwise once, and it looks like, oh, we'll get four actions in this last quarter. So we can gain the actions and rotate our wheels. And now it's time for us to go. We have four actions to spend. Now, one thing I think I'd like to start investing in is more production. We are nearing the end of this first round of the game, and making more stuff in future production rounds does seem like a good idea. With that in mind, I think let's start by sailing out of Lubeck up to Alborg again. And when we arrive here, let's buy goods with one action. Alborg is blue, and it looks like if we spent three actions doing this, we could actually gain a stone as well as a pelt. We haven't really talked about pelts and spices much at this point. You may have noticed they don't show up here, which means you can't buy or sell them using those alternate trade actions. But they do exist on all of the sell actions if you ever want to sell six or eight. And obviously selling six or eight goods is a very efficient way to get a bunch of money, as well as influence cubes on the board and into your own area. So having these luxury goods is certainly a good thing. Also, at the end of the game, each one of these is worth three votes, and again, having the most votes is how you win the game. All that being said, we are just doing a single action buy here, so this is a blue territory, which means we'll gain one fish. We can put that right here, and that's one of our actions used. Now let's sail again down to Ribe, and here... We do have the money to place a cube, and having cubes on the board is certainly a good thing. However, 
I have a different plan in mind for this turn. I want to focus on production. I don't want to sell, and I don't think I want to spend our coins here. So instead, let's do an alternate trade action. And unlike the brown player, instead of buying, let's sell. In particular, I don't think we really need this tool right now, and the tool is a third tier good. So when we sell it for an alternate trade action, that's going to get us five coins. We can put that right here, so we now have 12 coins total, and we also have two actions remaining. With that in mind, let's now sail to Hamburg. Here, let's spend one action and six of our coins in order to increase our influence income by one. So we can spend the five coins, the one action, and then we can find our influence income and put it onto the one spot. So that means when we do production, this will make us one influence cube that will go right into our personal supply. At this point, we have one action left. And I think we should sail from Hamburg over to London and then spend that last action and our final six coins to increase our wood production by two. As you can see, we indeed have six coins, so we can spend those and then find the wood production and put that on the two spot. So now that is two wood that we're going to produce at the start of the next round of the game. As you can see, I focused this turn on some infrastructure building. We're going to have four more productions throughout the game, so this is going to generate, hopefully, quite a bit of stuff that we can then use in order to get more cubes out on the board and more buildings constructed into Lubeck before the end of the game. Well, at this point, we are done with our turn, which means green can go, and just like the rest of us, they have four actions to use. They've decided to start by sailing from Lubeck up to Alberg, and here they're going to do a three-action buy. Alberg is blue, so for three actions they can gain a stone plus that box, which is also a stone, and a beer. So essentially two stone and a beer, or the gray over here does match. That means they could gain one fur pelt and one influence cube, and that's actually what they've decided to do. So they can add that influence cube into their personal supply, and then take this pelt and put it into their storage. That used three out of their four actions, and with their fourth They've decided to shake things up a little bit. They're going to sail over to Oslo and then spend their final action and five coins in order to place an influence cube from the general supply over here. As you can see, that is the second cube placed off to the side of Oslo, and it does go onto that cycling icon, which means this action card is now going to be removed. And then we have to draw the next one off the top of this gigantic stack of action cards. And that one, oh, it has a bunch of production on it. When we focus in, we can see the top row for one action lets you spend six coins to increase wheat production by two, but then for three actions and eight coins, you can increase your action point income by two. That means you put this action income next to the track, and that generates these one-shot action tokens that we've already seen the green player using. Now, at this point, even if the green player had extra actions, they would not be allowed to do any of these. You can only perform the actions on a newly revealed action card when you enter the city on your turn, not if you were already there. Well, green is done, so now it's time for the brown player to do the final seafaring turn of the round. And the first thing they're going to do is sail from Riga up to Raval. Here, they are going to spend two action points to do two splitting actions and gain one coin. The coin can go in front of them, and then they're going to split this glass up into four wheat. Again, the glass is a level four good, and wheat is a level one, so that works out. They, of course, have to add the wheat into their storage. And then for the second split, they're going to take this glass and turn it into two stone. Again, the stone is a level two, and glass is a level four, so two stone is what they can get out of it. That can go into their storage, and they still have two actions remaining, and they're going to head back to Riga, and it looks like they're going to sell. When we focus in, we can see that they are so close to being able to do a six-sell action. They have the two stone, the wheat, the meat, and they have a wood, but they don't have a fur pelt. That's fine, though. They'll spend one of their two remaining actions to do a four-sell. They have the two stone, one wheat, and a meat, and that is going to get them 10 money, as well as one influence into their personal supply. Just like that, they have a whole bunch of money now. And also, they are currently at a subsidiary city for themselves. That means, just like Lubeck, they can perform city actions, and they are going to feast. We can look over here and see that's going to need one fish and three wheat. They have exactly that. Well, I guess technically they have one wood left over, but either way, that worked out. They can put one of their cubes over here to mark that that feast happened. 
And remember, only a number of feasts can happen up to the player count in each round, so that was the second out of three possible feasts in this three-player game. The results of that feast is gaining three influence cubes into their personal supply. And at this point, they have one action left, and they are going to use that to sail down to Memel, and then that one action and five coins means they can increase their stone production by one. So far, they haven't been focusing on production at all. This is the first production that they even have. All right, it looks like Brown is done with their turn. And with that, the fourth quarter of the seafaring phase is over. This means we are done with the seafaring phase entirely, and we can move into the third and final phase of the round, which is the council hall phase. Now, the way this phase works is there are going to be two different council hall card auctions. We'll start with the first auction and then do the second one. And within each auction, we are going to secretly pick a number of our influence cubes in our personal supply, not the ones in the general supply. And then we are going to reveal those. And the player who revealed the most of these influence cubes will get first dibs at taking one of these cards. Then we move to the next smallest influence bid and keep going until everyone has bid. Now you have to bid at least one cube in order to take one of these cards, and this is why it's really important to have at least two of these cubes at the end of the seafaring phase, so at a minimum you could bid one for the top auction and one for the bottom so that you're going to get something. In a three-player game, as you can see, there are four cards in each of these auctions. There's always going to be one more than the player count. So it's time to do this first auction lot, and before we make our decision, we need to take a closer look at these cards. We can see this first one is 10 votes. At the end of the game, the player with the most votes is going to win, and there is a restriction here. You have to bid a minimum of five influence cubes to even be able to take this. And if you get this for five influence cubes, that could be a pretty good deal, considering 10 votes is a ton. Over here, this card is just going to get you three votes, which is obviously a lot worse than 10, but it does not have a minimum influence bid. Now this spot right here lets you take any improvement from the market like we've seen already, and then this one is set collection. At the end of the game, you are going to gain votes depending on the number of this card you have taken throughout the game. When we focus in, you can see that's three votes for one, all the way up to 30 votes if you have five of these cards. Now, I do want to point out that there's always going to be exactly one 10-vote card in the top auction, and there's also always going to be this gain improvement card in the top auction. In a three- or four-player game, there's also always going to be a three-vote card. That means only this one was randomly drawn from the deck, but all four of the City Hall cards in the second auction were randomly drawn. Speaking of those, we have to keep these in mind as well. We'll do the first auction and then the second auction, but we might want to hold some of our influence back to compete in this auction if maybe we like this stuff better. Now this right here is going to increase your one-shot action token production by one, so that's an extra action you'll have in the round, but it's also going to increase the amount of coins you have to pay during production by one. In addition to that, in this second lot, you'll notice these icons that match up with these printed icons on the board. If the top icon matches the bottom, then you also gain that. So by taking this card, you also gain one wheat. Next up, this one simply gets you this card, and this acts as extra storage. So you can literally put your items down onto it, adding four more slots that you can hold things, and, as you can see, that icon matches here, which means you gain an influence into your personal supply when you take this card from this position. Next up, this simply gets you a fish and a wood once, and finally this one is going to get you one wood because of that matching symbol, and this is an ongoing permanent ability. That means for the rest of the game, every time you construct one of these silver bordered houses, you pay two less wood for it. Considering most of these need some amount of wood, that could be a really powerful ongoing effect, especially when you can get it this early in the game. Well, it's time to auction, and it looks like we have five influence cubes. Orange has four, and green has four, so we are the only ones who are eligible to take this. Then again, if we spend all five of these to take those ten votes, we won't have any cubes left over to vie for the bottom auction lot, and there's some really good stuff in here as well. So I don't think it makes sense for us to put all five of these in, but of course, we're not going to tell our opponents that. Again, we have to figure out these bids secretly and simultaneously. So let's figure out our bids, and I think we're just going to bid one cube for the moment. I think these are slightly more interesting, in particular these two here. So we have our bid, and then our opponents can do their bids. We can reveal everything, and it looks like green bid two cubes. We bid one, and orange also bid one. Now whenever there is a tie for influence, 
that tie is going to be broken by the amount of money people have on hand. We have zero, and orange has six. That is more than us, so that means they break the tie. If we still had a tie here, then the tie would be broken by the current turn order. So unfortunately, it looks like we have a third pick, because we lost the tiebreaker to the orange player. And now it's time for green to pick one of these. Now again, they can't take this because they did not do a minimum bid of five cubes. And they've decided they're interested in engine over votes. So they're going to go right here. Now this lets them take an improvement. And these are the four that are currently up for offer. Now this one here says you can use it as you are selling something. And then you can spend three coins to swap two action cards out on the map. The next option here says you can use this as you are actually claiming a City Hall auction bonus. You forego that bonus that shows up at the bottom of the card in the second auction lot. Then you spend three coins and you get three votes. You simply take a three vote card and that's three more votes that you have for final scoring. Next up, this says you can flip this over as you are gaining one fur pelt in order to spend four coins and gain a second fur pelt. So that's a way to double down when you're gathering that luxury good. And finally, this one says you can flip this over while you are at a purple city. You then have to spend one of your actions, and then you can put a cube down influencing that city. Now, this is the one that the green player has decided to take, especially considering it works pretty well with this council order card. You can gain this once you have an influence cube placed into all four of the purple cities, and that gets you 13 coins, which is quite a lot. And of course, this is going to make it a lot easier to influence each one of those purple cities. So green can add this improvement right here, and then we can slide these over and bring out a new improvement. Oh, this one doesn't even have a uh, requirement at the top. You can simply flip this over as you are moving your ship to bypass two to three cities, which essentially means you are not required to spend an action in those cities as you pass through. Well, green is done with that, and now orange can pick, and I don't think it's too big of a surprise to see them take this. That is a minimum of three votes, as you can see, and it can get better if they get more of these before the game is over. So they'll put their orange influence cube here, and then take this card and put it next to them for final scoring. And then finally, the only option for us is this card right here, because of course, again, we don't have a minimum of five cubes to take the 10 votes. So that is going to be three votes for final scoring, and we could just put this into our area. And now it's time for the second auction. It's important to note we're going to leave these cubes out here because these will be important when it comes to figuring out the new turn order for the next round. Now this second auction works the same way as the first. We have to simultaneously figure out our bids. We have four cubes currently, and we don't have to spend all these. We could hold some back for the next round, but honestly, I really like the idea of this wood discount, so I think we're going to put all of our cubes in. Now we have to wait for our opponents, and it looks like everybody put all their cubes in. We have four compared to the three of orange and the two for green, so that means we get to choose first, then orange, and then green. Well, I've already spoiled that I think this is the card we want. It's kind of funny, this comes with a wood, which we won't need as much with this discount, but I still think this is fine. We could upgrade that wood into something else, and some of those buildings do need even more wood than this discount. Although that being said, we already have this two wood discount here, so I imagine we'll be doing something else with that wood item. Either way, even though we're doubling down on this wood discount, I still think this is a good pick. So we can grab one wood from the supply, and then leave this nearby and put the wood into our storage. Next up, Orange has to pick, and they've decided to go for this card here. Once again, that is going to gain them one wheat from that bonus down below, and this is going to increase their action point production by one, but it will also increase their coin cost by one. They can gain all of these. Their action point production token is here, and then their coin penalty token is right there. Finally, green can pick one of these, and they'll go for this one. They could increase their storage, but that's not a big deal for them right now. They figure it's nice to have an extra fish and wood lying around. So they can put those into their storage. Well, we're now done with the council hall phase, and that is going to bring this first round to a close. We can now move to the first phase of the next round, and the first thing that we do for that is round preparation. 
Now, the first step of this involves figuring out the new turn order. The way this works is we count up the number of influence cubes that were bid into both of these auctions combined in the previous round. The player who bid the most will go first, second most will go second, etc. And if there is a tie between players, then the tied player who has more coins will get to break the tie in their favor. And if there is still a tie, then you just maintain the turn order between those tied players. In this case, we have five of these influence cubes. Green has four and brown has four. That means we will be first, and then there is a tie between green and brown. And it looks like green has no coins, and brown has six, so that means they will take the lead. They'll get to be the second player, and green will be third. After that, we can take all of these influence cubes from the auction area and return those to the general supply. After that, we can reveal the next round marker, and any of these feast markers can go back to the general supply. As you can see in round two, it's going to cost five coins instead of four to buy plots of land. We can also do a small and a large feast in order to get way more of those cubes to use in the auction, although the cost to actually perform that feast is quite a bit higher. It's worth noting there is still a limit of three feasts total combined within both of these feast types. After that, we need to take all six of these period indicators. Again, these have the action points that we're going to use in the seafaring phase. We need to shuffle these up, and then we are going to take four of them and put them down onto the quarter spots. And then the other two won't be used in this round. The final thing we have to do to prepare for the next round is to get the council hall ready. Now, all of the cards from the previous round that were not taken are going to be discarded unless it is one of these tens, the improvement, or the three. The reason for that is because there's always going to be a ten, improvement, and a three. Since a three was taken, we can just take a new one and put it out. Obviously, if a ten was taken, we would take a new one and put that out as well. And then, obviously, we also leave this out so it can be used again in the next round. The ordering of these doesn't really matter. I suppose we can group those right next to each other. And now we're going to draw new cards from the top of the deck to fill in all of the spots according to the player count. Again, it's going to be one more than the number of players in each row, so four. This one, oh, that's interesting. So this is a card you actually put next to you for end game scoring. That says at the end of the game, if you have a meat, a beer, a wood, and a wheat in front of you, then you can give those up to gain six votes again during final scoring. So that becomes a goal for you to have at the end of the game. Of course, that is going to take up storage spaces. So if you have a couple of these and you are just holding on to things for end game scoring, maybe getting some extra storage space is not a bad idea. We have to keep filling these in. The next one gets you a stone and a wheat. After that, oh, it's one of those set collection cards. And it also comes with an influence cube. After that, oh, this is another one of those ongoing effects. You put this in front of you, and it says for the rest of the game, every time you buy a plot of land, you spend two less coins. And this does come with one wood. And then finally, we have another one of those that hangs out in front of you for the rest of the game. That comes with a coin, and it immediately lowers your coin liability by four as soon as you take it. We haven't quite seen this in action yet, but we will soon. And it's certainly nice having to pay up to four less coins during production. The council hall is ready, but we do also have to refresh these improvements just a little bit. The far right one is going to go away, then we'll slide all of them down, and then bring out a new one. This one can be used when you do a cell of six, and it comes with an extra coin and an extra influence cube into your personal supply. Last but not least, all of the players can refresh all of their exhausted improvements, because remember we can use these once per round, and so we're ready to use that building discount again, and I'm sure Orange is going to try to leverage this one to get more of those influence cubes onto the map. Same with the green player, they haven't used this one yet because they just picked it up, but it's definitely a great way to get more influence on the map. Well, preparation is done, and now it's time for the production step of this first phase. Now, the way production works is pretty simple. We just gain or lose things depending on where these tokens are. Our money production is at 4, so that's going to gain us 4 money. Then our wood production is at 2, so we'll gain 2 wood. I have to admit, I'm starting to think maybe this wasn't the right call, considering we have so much wood in front of us, and we have so many wood discounts. But again, there's ways to upgrade things, and also just sell these to get a pile of money, so I'm not overall that worried. I suppose it's nice having these discounts, so that we can focus on selling this wood. Next up, we are going to gain an income of one influence cube into our personal supply. And lastly, we have a single coin liability. We have to spend one coin, and put that back into the bank. After that, the brown player is going to gain one stone and one action point token. 
and then they are going to have to spend one coin, which they have. Finally, the green player is going to produce two beer, which seems great, until you realize they owe three money, and they don't have any money in front of themselves. They were so focused on other plans, they would forgot to hold on to this money to cover that. Now, this is certainly something you want to avoid, because when you can't afford this, you take a minus two vote card, which you will have for the rest of the game. So that's just going to make it harder to win, but it looks like that's the situation the green player found themselves in. Well, that's finished production, so this first phase is done, and it would now be time for the second phase, which is seafaring, but I think at this point I'm going to stop playing through the game and instead talk about what happens when the game is over. Now, I've mentioned before that we're going to play through five rounds, and once we finish the council hall phase of the fifth round of the game, we immediately move into final scoring. The first thing we'll gain endgame votes for is influence majorities in the regions out here on the map. Again, there is a green, purple, blue, yellow, and pink region, and the player who has the most influence cubes in each one of these regions is going to gain the largest amount of votes according to the color, and the player with the second most will gain the smaller number. If there is a tie for influence, then you simply add those two numbers up and divide by the number of tied players. When we focus in, you can see that these vote benefits range from one region to the next, and across all of the regions, it still makes sense to try and get those majorities for those endgame votes. Now, I do want to point out that influence cubes off to the right count just as much as influence cubes which make a city a subsidiary for a player. So that means right now the brown player has a majority in the pink area with this one. Green has a majority in yellow with that one. There is a tie between brown and green in the blue area. And so far, nobody's actually gone into the green or purple areas, but we've only finished the first out of five rounds in the game so far. Now, before we move on from this map, there is one other note I want to mention about influencing these regions. Every time a player puts at least one of their influence cubes into every city within a color region, they immediately increase their influence production by one. Once again, that is this token right here, and that means up to five times in the game you can gain these influence bumps. Of course, you're going to have to go pretty wide with those influence cubes, but it's definitely a reason to try and get a cube into every city of at least a few of these regions before the game is over. After we score those influence majorities, it will then be time to score our building strength majorities down here in Lubeck. As I mentioned before, the city is split into five different districts, and within each district, there is a first and second place vote scoring to the player who has the most strength with their buildings and the second most strength. Again, if there's a tie, then you sum these up and split it amongst the tied players. At this point, I'm sure you're wondering what the strength of buildings is, and that's pretty simple. It has to do with the buildings being silver or golden bordered. The strength of a building is the same as its coin liability, so these silver bordered buildings have a strength of 1, and the gold bordered buildings add a strength of 2 as you find to be the strongest within that district. Now that's the case for most of the buildings. For example, we have one strength over here and green has two over there, but there is a bunch of different buildings in this game. We can see a couple of exceptions. For example, one is the lighthouse. Now the lighthouse only costs three stone to construct, but then up to four times in the game during production, you can spend two stone to add one of your cubes onto that lighthouse. If we focus in on the lighthouse itself, you can see there are four spots for those cubes, and every single cube that is placed onto the lighthouse adds one to its overall strength. So that means if you manage to spend enough stone throughout the game, you could actually get a five strength lighthouse, one for the tile, and then one for each one of those cubes. Again, the additional strength from the cubes is a special thing specific to the lighthouse. But that's not the only building with an end game focused effect. For example, there is also the guard house, and that is going to increase the strength of orthogonally adjacent buildings of that specific player. And this is one of the reasons why you might want to really think about where you're going to place your buildings, because a guard house placed in the right area could add strength to a variety of different districts as we're vying to get as many of these votes as possible. Once we've scored all of the building's votes, it will then be time to score all of our remaining influence in our personal supply. For every three influence that we have, we will gain three votes. So essentially one vote per influence, but again, they come in chunks of three. So if you end the game with two influence, then that is going to offer no extra votes for you. After that, players are going to gain three votes for every luxury good they still have in their storage. Once again, luxury goods are the pelts and the spices. 
After that, players can score council cards like these. Once again, this is going to gain votes depending on the number of that card you have, and this one will get you extra votes if you are able to spend the indicated goods. Now, players are going to add the votes they got during final scoring to all the votes they were able to pick up as the game was going on, and the player with the most votes will be the winner. Well, at this point, I do believe I've covered most of the rules to the game, so that's going to bring this tutorial to a close. I hope you enjoyed learning how to play Alderman. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.